We don't invest in companies unless they have meaningful revenues, and in the same fashion, we don't invest in solutions looking for problems, and the hydrogen economy is often talked about as this up-and-coming investment thesis that everyone ought to be doubling down on, and there are some myths there that need to be dispelled. So today we're going to talk about the hydrogen thesis from a 30,000-foot viewpoint. We're going to cover two broad use cases. First is transportation, what most retail investors are familiar with when they think about the hydrogen economy. And the other is hydrogen for industry. And we also want to differentiate between two types of investors. So there's the type that wants to generate alpha, period. That's what we do. We invest for the sole purpose of generating alpha. Then you have investors that want to save the planet and generating alpha is secondary. And as an example would be this individual who was featured in the esteemed New York Times and says, investing for me is a form of activism to create the world I want to see. That's great that you're able to convince people to part with $400 million for your fund and that your idea of democratizing access to wealth is to start distributing money from the 5% of creators that capture 95% of the value and start distributing that to the other 95% of creators. Well, there's a reason for that. And it's because 95% of what's out there is total tripe. So the entire Web 3.0 thesis is wrought with problems and thought leaders like this create problems when they start focusing on their own ideals, what they think society ought to look like instead of focusing on showing their investors a return. So when we invest in green technologies, Our belief is that subsidizing them will eventually not scale. They have to be able to stand on their own. Sure, you can make the argument that early on we should step in and help subsidize certain technologies so they can get off the ground. That seems to be what's happening with hydrogen, and then we're going to talk about today why that might not be a good idea. So there's either money to be made solving problems using technologies or there isn't. And as soon as you can figure out whether or not a technology is economically viable, the better. Graphene investors will tell you how important that is. We're not running a welfare program. We invest for the sole purpose of generating a return on our money. So let's start talking about hydrogen. What is hydrogen? Very quickly, doesn't matter if we're talking about the most abundant, oldest chemical element in the universe or Swiss cheese. It's a commodity that we're going to discuss, and there are a number of types of hydrogen, and they're usually portrayed as colors. You can see her on this chart. The takeaway from this slide is that at the end of 2021, around 96% of hydrogen that's used as an input for industrial processes is dirty in that it comes from fossil fuels. Only 4% of hydrogen is green. So green advocates may want to focus on the fact that when we're talking about hydrogen, there's a substantial amount that needs to be displaced by green hydrogen, thus the low-hanging fruit that can be addressed by uh, thinking about investing in hydrogen. So let's talk a little bit about what hydrogen is used for. Here you can see that the majority of hydrogen consumption is used to produce ammonia. So there's your low-hanging fruit. Let's figure out how to produce ammonia using green hydrogen. Well, we need to figure out how to produce green hydrogen cheaper than we produce other types of hydrogen from fossil fuel. So if you look at the ammonia problem, companies around the world already produce about $60 billion worth of ammonia every year, primarily as a fertilizer, very important, so that we can grow food. You can see what happens in Sri Lanka when we decide to stop using fertilizers. The evangelists for renewable ammonia will need to displace one of the world's biggest, dirtiest, and most time-honored industrial processes, something called Haber-Bosch. This is according to a great article by Science that describes the problem. So a $60 billion opportunity is there for anyone that can displace the dirty method of producing hydrogen today. So in terms of the two use cases we talked about earlier, industrials and transportation, we see where the problem lies in industrials, and that's going to be a very difficult problem to solve. And it will, uh, if it gets solved, that will happen as a result of technology. Now, let's talk about the second use case, which is transportation. So just to give you an idea of how early days it is for hydrogen transportation, 
In 2020, there was an estimated 150,900 passenger cars produced every day around the world. Well, the total number, and I had to double check this, it's so incredible, the total number of fuel cell electric vehicles right now worldwide is just under uh, 26,000 cars. So it's, it's just a novelty. Buses are around 5,600. You can read the numbers here. We took this from the IEA. Interestingly, Interestingly enough, they said that low emission hydrogen is less than 1% of global hydrogen production in 2021. So we can tell by these numbers that fuel cell electric vehicles are early days and the plug power investors will point to, well, what about forklifts and things like that? In this presentation, we're really going to shy away from talking about those use cases in that particular company, probably the most popular fuel cell stock out there. We'll save that for another day. Today, we want to talk about the economic viability of hydrogen for transportation. So we're going to bring up an individual that seems to be generating a lot of controversy these days. You know who he is, and he refers to fuel cells as fool cells. Now, the article that was produced by Clean Technica that talked about his statement and the primary reason for that provided this very powerful chart. In our minds, this is the showstopper. So you can see here that these are three different ways that we can use renewable electricity to power vehicles. In the first column there, we have battery electric vehicles with a fuel production efficiency of 95%. Move to the right of that, you have hydrogen with an efficiency of 52%. Why would you waste your time messing around with hydrogen? We can take that renewable energy and utilize it to its fullest capabilities by putting it right into battery-powered electric vehicles. This is a showstopper. And in attempting to steal, man, that means try to come up with the most viable argument for hydrogen, you try to get past this. And I did. I researched this quite heavily. We had internal discussions in our team as to the biases that come from individuals who are pro-Tesla, pro-electric vehicles, trying to think how fuel cells might compete. And this diagram makes it seem impossible. And the next argument says, well, technology will come to the rescue. Sure, that may be the case, but just remember that same technology is being used to improve electric vehicles as well. So this article here by Caroline Delbert. It says, why Elon Musk thinks fuel cells are staggeringly dumb. Does he have a point? Well, one of the major obstacles in the hydrogen ideas pipeline is that it's still too hard and expensive to get usable hydrogen. Remember, we invest because we need to show an ROI. Remember what we talked about subsidi subsidization. These technologies need to stand on their own. So most hydrogen used now is separated by electrolysis, and most of that is powered by fossil fuels. Whoops, so there's a problem. Now, what Musk is overlooking here is that it took decades to get electric vehicles off the ground, during which the technology to power them improved exponentially. Indeed, it did. But whilst fuel cells are improving, the technology in electric vehicles will be improving as well. So when we look at hydrogen itself and fueling stations. This is quite interesting. So transporting hydrogen, very difficult. Most uh, experts say that it needs to be produced at the place where it's needed. That's the only viable way for the hydrogen economy to work. And when you look at the number of fuel stations, again, I've had to triple check these numbers to make sure that there's not three extra zeros. In the United States, you have 54 hydrogen fueling stations in the state of California. And you can see the biggest uh, number of hydrogen fueling stations in China at 250. So there's just very few of these, probably for that reason, because in order to transport large amounts of hydrogen, it must be either pressurized and delivered as a com uh, compressed gas or liquefied. So when you look at the push to build out the infrastructure in the hydrogen economy, you see mixed results in this particular article where it's titled Shell Quietly Pulls the Plug on Hydrogen in the UK. And they talk about how they're 
prototype technology for hydrogen refueling stations had reached its end of life, and that in the UK now there are a total of 11 public H2 refueling stations that remain open. Contrast that to 57,000 public charging points for electric vehicles. The company behind that push by Shell, at least in the UK, is ITM Power. That's a stock that we've covered before. Now, in Germany, You'll see some different results as Shell opens more hydrogen fuel stations. One of the reasons uh, for that could be BMW's hydrogen push. This is their recently announced hydrogen SUV, sharp looking vehicle. It's said to address niche use cases. And the biggest perk of hydrogen seems to be the rapid re refueling. So it takes three to four minutes to refuel that SUV you see right there, as opposed to, let's say, 15 minutes fast charging. So they're arguing that, well, people that don't have access to super fast charging for electric vehicles will use hydrogen. Well, maybe, but as the hydrogen economy starts to develop, the time that takes for technology to solve the problems, the charging for electric vehicles will get faster and faster. They seem to think BMW is making a big push towards hydrogen. There's a big investment being made in Europe for the hydrogen economy and uh, in the United States, at least according to what lawmakers say, seems to lead that uh, medium to heavy trucks are the way forward. And maybe that's the case, but we turned to another expert who spent a great deal of time in this piece. It was a two-part series. It's an excellent read from Bloomberg NEF. It's called Separating Hype from Hydrogen. And this individual concludes that we know, in theory, green hydrogen could be used throughout industry transport power and heating. However, it won't magically happen in sectors that don't currently use it just because it's green. Exactly. Hydrogen is going to have to win use case by use case, but it won't be easy. Why? Because it has to beat the other technologies. It has to beat every other zero carbon option for every use case. And he, he concludes, this is where hydrogen hype really meets reality. And he concludes that none of the compelling use cases for hydrogen are widely distributed. This perhaps is why plug power has reached traction because their uh, use cases involve forklifts and things like that, where the fueling and everything can take place in, in one uh, particular center. And there's no massive demand for hydrogen filling stations, nor boilers, nor hydrogen-based heat in most industries, and that the overwhelming bulk of use will be in the chemicals industry and the power system, not in transportation. Now, you may see, as in the case of BMW, some novel applications. Here's one. This is the world's largest hydrogen-powered truck, and it was debuted this, or say, well, it's last year now, in May of 2022 in uh, South Africa. That's where I'm currently at right now. And these quotes here, what we're launching is not merely an impressive piece of machinery. It is the genesis of an entire ecosystem powered by hydrogen. It's a gigantic leap for South Africa's hydrogen future economy. This has been a historic moment. It gives us a clear vision of what the future looks like. Well, the gentleman who spoke those words, you see him here, President Cyril Ramaphosa. And his priorities may be a little bit out of place. So this newspaper article here says South Africa launches world's biggest hydrogen fuel truck and that some countries have pledged $8.5 billion to help South Africa become a low carbon economy. South Africa has a lot more problems to deal with right now, like keeping the lights on. I'm giving this presentation using a generator. I was traveling to the farming communities using the Intercape bus when I discovered that those buses are often attacked by the mafia. The bus drivers are shot. The passengers are robbed. They're ran off the road. The ministry uh, individual here in, in responsible for transportation, the minister of transportation, has been asked to solve these problems. He says, they're not my concern. And that was uh, the courts forced him to address these problems just over Christmas. Farm attacks, these are real. They're happening regularly. They're a huge problem. It's the most dangerous occupation in the world. I've talked to farmers in the farming community, and these are real problems. Police impersonators drive around here in Joburg, where I'm at, and you'll get pulled over by the police. They'll put a gun to your head and take all your stuff. That's because the police are helping the criminals and 
some cases because they're so corrupt, giving them uniforms, giving them cars. Police are being shot with their own guns that they're selling criminals. Traffic stop shakedowns. Those happen. Eight hours of what they call load shedding. That's a very soft way of saying that there's no electricity eight hours per day. You want citizenship in this country? Talk to a lot of foreigners here. They've stayed here for a long time, a Rwandan driving a taxi cab driver, or somebody from Swaziland who has property here. They want their citizenship. That'll cost you about 3K. That's 3,000 US dollars. And there was a Chinese fellow here they found not too long ago that had citizenship and a driver's license being here two weeks, couldn't speak a lick of English. So don't expect the media to be expressing much outrage for these problems. Don't expect to read much about them, but they're very real. So it's very important that we prioritize what we're working on and make sure that it's not a solution looking for a problem and that we're addressing problems that matter. So South Africa has a lot more problems to deal with than becoming a hydrogen economy. Hydrogen for transportation, outside of some niche use cases that we've kind of uh, probed a little bit about there, it needs to achieve 100% efficiency to scale, or let's say at least needs to be as efficient as electric vehicles in terms of um, its utilization. Otherwise, what's the point? Technology may solve hydrogen's deficiencies, as many of the proponents say it will, but it's also propelling electrics deficiencies at the same time. Things like fast charging. How long will that advantage last for hydrogen vehicles? We don't see it as a compelling investment thesis across the board. So we'd ask those who are watching this video, what's your steel, man? What's the most compelling reasons that you can come up with why we should consider investing in hydrogen. So before you put those comments in the comment section, please click this logo on the right-hand side that says Nanalyze. Subscribe to our channel. That helps support us. And I've also put up a video here on Tesla, uh, finding the next Tesla that you might find, in, uh, find interesting. Thanks for taking the time to watch this today.